Hello everyone and welcome to the third Funk Prog Sweden this year. Uh, the agenda for today, we will have an we will have a pure functional programming in Dart by Björn Sperber and then we will have meta programming in Erlang by Max Nordlund. And then in the end I will go through the schedule and the summary of the meetup. First up, I would like to thank our video sponsor, Adabit. Adabit is a small consulting company based in Stockholm, where most of the developers have a background within functional programming. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the YouTube chat and we will read them up for the presenters so they can answer them. Um, also, if you would like to kind of continue and have more functional programming running on YouTube, please also subscribe to our channel so more people can see and view this. With that said, let's start. First presentation, Pure Functional Programming in Dart by Björn Sperber. Welcome, Björn. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Magnus. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm Björn Sperber, and I will just start presenting here. Um, and I thought I'd talk to you today about Pure Functional Programming in Dart, and since probably not many of you out there are familiar that much with Dart. I thought I'd also like give a brief intro to, to Dart in general. Yeah, I am a developer at Soundtrap, which is currently, or nowadays it's a part of Spotify. Um, and first I thought I'd talk a bit more about me. So if we look back a couple of years to my previous job, um, I was uh, working at a company where we were transitioning our core applications to Scala. Uh, and in my team, we didn't really have deep functional programming experience, but we were very interested in it. And I had like studied functional programming at university, but, and yeah, we, we, we knew a bit about it, but we haven't applied much of it to commercial applications. So we, we sort of took it very bit by bit and we we all like saw the benefits of immutability so we started with just like modeling our domains as immutable uh, objects and then it's sort of a slippery slope so in order to work effectively with immutability we discovered lenses and uh, found them to be fantastic and uh, scala the scala standard libraries make great use of option and either so like you you naturally get acquainted with those but then you start sort of looking under the hood and discover this topic of monads. And of course you get interested and then sort of you go from there and discover the state monads and free stuff like that. Uh, but in general, we, we learned to like embrace types and I'm going to talk very much about like the statically typed Haskell inspired uh, flavor of pure, pure functional programming, but uh, I, I know there are other flavors, uh, so, so I hope uh, some of what I'm going to talk about will be applicable, even if you're not sort of sworn to that particular school of functional programming. But also we learn to isolate IO and the benefits of isolating IO and pushing it like to the borders of your application. And uh, yeah, we, we, we got better and saw gradual benefits, like the more functional techniques we applied and really felt that this paid off. Like we, we got the modularity we were hoping for, composability, testability, most definitely. Like that, that was one of our driving factors to, to get to that promised testability of pure functional code. And in general, we, we saw like beauty in it. So I was very, very happy and sort of uh, wanted to learn more and invested more and more in it and generally felt that things got better, the more functional techniques we applied. So I, I was really happy with that and, and in general loving it. But then if we skip ahead a couple of years, I uh, was contacted by an old colleague that I sort of admired a lot and felt like I could learn a lot more from. And he was working on a music project, uh, which turned out to be Soundtrap which at that point in time was not a part of Spotify. Um, 
but uh, now is. And Soundtrap makes a free or freemium, easy to use collaborative digital audio workstation that runs on all major browsers and on most conceivable OSs. Uh, if you're even the slightest interested in audio production, music production, podcast production, check it out at soundtrap.com. Uh, so there's my little blurb. Uh, but yeah, I, I took the bait. Uh, this sounded like too much fun to, to pass up. And I was sort of voluntarily ripped out of my FP Scala environment and suddenly found myself programming in Dart because Soundtrap, uh, the, the core product, the studio, uh, is coded in Dart. And what is Dart? So it's a language that is made by Google. And initially, it was <clears throat> intended to, to complement or maybe even replace JavaScript in the browser. It was supposed to be like natively supported. You're supposed to like just change the language attribute in script tags, and you could code in Dart, and it was fully integrated and had JIT VMs and all that stuff. And there were for a while Dart VMs integrated into Chromium builds. Uh, but it didn't pan out, as we all know. Uh, and uh, while you can still very effectively use Dart to write web applications, uh, the, the, the SDK comes with um, excellent optimizing JavaScript compilers for Dart. Everyone's now given up on the idea that it would ever be natively integrated into browsers. But because Dart was intended to like work in the browser and like support streaming execution and stuff like that, it had some oddities to it. So in Dart 1, like the, there wasn't a proper static type system, whereas now Dart has been reborn as Dart 2, and it is now mainly uh, promoted as the language of Flutter. And if you haven't heard of Flutter, it is a cross-platform application framework originally targeting Android and iOS, but now also targeting desktop and web once again. So the circle is complete. Uh, if, if, you're, if that sounds interesting, check it out on flutter.dev. But this was Dart 2, and Dart 2 sort of shed a lot of the baggage that Dart 1 had because it was no longer, like it, it had different motivations. It was no, no longer intended as a native browser language. So Dart 2 is like much more coherent and uh, less strange than Dart 1. So what does Dart look like? Well, it's intentionally designed to be boring uh, in that it should look familiar if you're already acquainted with other uh, like traditional OOP languages. So if you're used to C++ or Java, you will probably have no problem like reading Dart code um, it has some like quirks here and there, but uh, uh, generally most people will find it very familiar. It's got tradition. Oh, right. <laughs> I am so sorry. I forgot to screen share. Uh, I am not sharing my slides and I will do so now. Terribly sorry about that. So now you see my slides. I hope you didn't miss too much. But yeah, let's get back into it. So uh, Dart um, supports traditional classes and has a relatively standard inheritance model, supports runtime polymorphism like any like classic OOP language. Compared to, for example, JavaScript, it's got a proper module system built in. Uh, with nice features such as like language level support and support for deferred loading and other stuff. So it's uh, like it's less tacked on than module system you would find in JavaScript, although the end result is, is similar. Dart also has its own async and concurrency model and uh, language constructs to support that and standard library abstractions such as future and stream that interact with this uh, async model, which is in general richer and more flexible than the native async model you found, find in the browser. And it's also relatively currently implemented across targets 
that Dart can compile to. Um, it's it's really really well designed. It's definitely not like functional programming compliant. Uh, it it's not properly pure, but it's incredibly useful and uh, works really well for what it was intended to do. And yes, Dart two has a proper static type system. It's still a bit of a strange type system, but it's there. In Dart 1, it sort of kind of pretended to be there at some times, but it clearly didn't really have a real static type system. Um, so it sports local type inference, which is nice. Uh, you got parametric polymorphism in the forms of generic type parameters for classes, methods, and functions. Um, at, like compared to Scala functions, like free floating functions, Dart functions are properly polymorphic, whereas they're monomorphic in Scala, for example. You got your basic type constraints, nothing too fancy. And similar to Scala, again, you can sort of opt out of the static type system and go fully dynamic when you want to. Uh, for example, when uh, manipulating JSON structure or something, uh, you can basically ask the static type system to temporarily back off, and then you can call it back when you, when when you need it again. It's got the strangest variance rules you can imagine. Um, more of a problem when not doing FP than when doing FP, because it will only really like kill you when you're working with mutable structures. But it's still odd. I think they're trying to fix it. Not sure. And just a couple of weeks ago, Dart 2.12 was released and uh, now introduces uh, non-nullable types by default, which you can opt into when you're running in Dart 2.12. And it looks very similar to uh, how Kotlin and uh, to a degree TypeScript does it, uh, but it's great. So now it's fully integrated in all the tooling, static analysis. So um, you, you sort of have control over where nullable types and actual null values can, can propagate through your code. So that's really nice. So how is Dart, how, how does Dart fare as a functional language? Some parts good and some parts less good. It's definitely not intended to be used. Like the, the, the original language designers and the standard libraries, I mean, they, they are not uh, like, uh, they didn't intend it to be used from a pure functional programming perspective, but it's got some things going for it. So we have our immutable references uh, using the final keyword, and it works just as it does in Java, more or less. Uh, so nothing fancy there, but it's good to have. And of course, we have first class functions, which is great when you're doing functional programming. You can treat functions as values, and they're polymorphic in their types, and all that works great, lexical closures and all. Uh, and higher order functions are very, very present. So functions can take functions as arguments and return functions as result values. And a lot of the Dart standard library APIs use higher order functions. So it's like, it's very, very normal for Dart code to use higher order functions, although not necessarily in, in a referentially transparent way. Oh, right. And here I go on about parametric polymorphism again. I like parametric polymorphism, but I maybe mentioned it once or twice too many now. OK, let's look at what Dart doesn't do great from a pure functional perspective. So there are no algebraic data types and no pattern matching <clears throat> to support algebraic data types yet. This might change. And there are some nice tools that through code generation do a decent job of simulating um, ADTs through sealed class hierarchies and generated methods that sort of simulate pattern matching. But it would be nice to have it natively supported in a language. Uh, the standard libraries contain absolutely no proper persistent immutable collections. So that's a, a big downer. Um, and there's no tail call elimination. So if you try to express algorithms recursively, you definitely run the risk of blowing the stack. Um, right, and here I'm talking about variance control again. Would be nice with variance control, but it's, it's, it's a bonus, I guess. There is no support in the type system for higher kind of types. And if you're familiar with like the standard 
Haskell type class hierarchies, a lot of them are higher kinded and they don't express well in Dart. There are some tricks you can do to kind of express them, but it's you have to choose where whether it's like inelegant or slow or properly typed. So yeah, that's that's a bit of a bummer. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the standard libraries are not purely functional at all, and they they um, are very voidy and will throw exceptions in your face at the slightest provocation. Um, so so here I was in Dart and uh, had just left sort of a very FP world, and I had a lot of fun. I loved the product and I loved coding in it and really enjoyed programming in Dart. It was, uh, I mean, it's generally a, a really nice language to program in, but I, I was definitely missing the FP parts. And, and I think I was maybe a bit damaged by FP as I did have problem viewing non FP code as like, as beautiful. And I, I missed the beauty of, of, uh, pure FP properly applied. And I'd also grown very used to basically nothing being mutable. And now I was surrounded by mutable fields and collections and suddenly had to start reasoning globally again, which I'd sort of learned that, okay, I don't need to do that anymore. And, and things just got like more difficult to do. And you had to think about more things and it, it wasn't that straightforward. And I also missed, uh, for example, ADTs and pattern matching and a lot of like functional techniques sort of replace some of the standard like OOP patterns with more elegant functionality, I believe at least. So it felt very, very weird to like, instead of doing a pattern match over a nice sealed hierarchy, sealed ADT felt, felt super strange to do the visitor pattern for it, for example, which just looks very clumsy in comparison, I think. Very subjective. Oh, and then there's null. <clears throat> I was not happy to get reacquainted with null. Um, uh, I had learned to um, express partiality and failures through option and either and other things that are visible in the type system. And at least before Dart 2.12, nullability is not visible in the type system and it can attack you at any point. Um, so that scared me. Oh, and exceptions, like um, exceptions are great for truly exceptional cases, I believe, uh, but at least the Dart standard libraries maybe overuse them a bit. And as we all know, that kills referential transparency. And Dart also has the flavor of exceptions that once again are not visible uh, in type signatures. So once again, you have to be very, very defensive, which I didn't used to be when working with option and either and stuff like that. And once again, I had to apply global reasoning where it felt like I should get by with local reasoning. And right, yeah, sure, uncontrolled side effects. Um, once again, I, I keep repeating myself, but I had gotten used to testability more or less coming as, as a bonus feature of just applying pure functional design. And now I had to think about it again and use some of the sometimes unwieldy techniques used in traditional OP in order to, to write testable code. So, so that was a bit of a bummer as well. So what I started doing was write, start writing a library for Dart for functional programming in Dart. And I'm not sure how it should be pronounced. Uh, I haven't really decided, or I, I don't really have a strong opinion. I'm gonna call gonna call it Dart Z in this presentation, but yeah, I could change my mind. Um, and I definitely borrowed heavily from Scala Z and its uh, spiritual successor cats, Clojure and Haskell, and sort of uh, tried to to make something that would feel familiar if you come from those environments. So I started with just implementing option either because I missed them and I needed them for the next step, which was to write some basic immutable collections because I really missed those. And I really missed like proper immutable collections that are persistent, structure sharing, efficient when applying functional techniques on them. And then I did shoehorn in some encodings of fundamental Haskell type classes. 
so if you're into that kind of FP, you've got your monoids and your functors and your monads. They're not expressed sort of in as useful a way as you're probably familiar with them from Scala and Haskell, but they are still useful. Um, and uh, uh, they clarify t intent, if nothing else. Uh, but since Dart lacks higher kind of types, you can't sort of use them as freely as you would in languages that do. Right, I need more stuff as well. I always need more stuff. So I needed a state monad, I needed lenses, of course, I needed tuples, lots of them. And uh, once again, because Dart 2, at least, it's very hard to simulate higher kind of types, then monad transformer stacking becomes very clumsy. So I've actually instead opted of hard coding a couple of generally useful monad stacks. And the most powerful is called evaluation. And it consists of like the monad stack that I often ended up with in Scala. So there's reader writer state either and asynchronicity support wrapped into one. It is clumsy. I'm aware of that, but it's, uh, it's a compromise just to get a decent encoding that is easy to work with and fully safely typed in Dart at the moment. Free monad, I needed a free monad. And if you're familiar with the Coriunata trick, uh, the implementation in Dart said uses the Coriunata trick to make it sort of of the freer flavor, meaning that we don't need to supply a functor for any type constructor that we lift into free. So uh, you can lift any type constructor into free. There is also a pure functional streaming module in there. It's, uh, it works, uh, but it's still like, it should have a nicer API and it's still considered experimental. And of course, there's also bridge code in order to integrate all this with the built-in Dart types and the standard library thing. So uh, stuff to like convert between uh, Dart mutable lists and immutable lists and maps and stuff like that. And also type class instances for a lot of the built-in types. So there are monoids for, for integers and strings and lists and stuff like that. And a lot of other stuff. So I thought I'd quickly just blast through the collections that are available in Dart Z. So there's first iList, which is very, very similar to standard closure lists and also standard uh, Scala immutable lists. So just like those structure, it's a standard singly linked cons list and has very, very similar time complexity. So uh, cons head and tail, uh, big O1 complexity and uh, traversals are efficient, but random access isn't. So if you need random access, there is I vector, which once again is very similar to closure vectors and also Scala immutable vectors. Um, and they give you better time complexity for random access and updates and a couple of other things that iList is not good at. Then there is IMAP, which is an immutable map. And uh, it is implemented using self-balancing sorted trees and therefore has efficient um, lookups and updates by key. And since it's sorted, it's also got efficient minimum, maximum, least upper bound and greatest lower bound operations, as well as ranged folds that are very, very efficient. Uh, so besides being a, a generally useful map structure, it uh, <clears throat> usually deals with timeline-like structures, uh, timeline-like data well, uh, especially where you want to do like windowing and sort of look at uh, time intervals or similar things that are sort of sequentially a bit sparse. Uh, oh, right. And there's also ISET. And that is essentially an IMAP of something to bool and it behaves just like it. Uh, but but it's, a, it's a fully functioning and reasonably efficient immutable persistent set. And then there are some specialized structures on top of this, but I just thought I'd um, quickly go through uh, the most important ones. And uh, yeah, let's do some live coding. I will pop over to some code.
So what I've got prepared here is just something to maybe get you acquainted with, with Dart in general, just to see like, okay, this is how Dart looks like. And also look at how some of the immutable structure in Dart Z look like, and uh, maybe some, uh, some of the benefits of uh, sort of applying Haskell-like type classes on top of this and see how we can do Haskell-like collection transformations. Um, all right, the first time here, this is where we import our library. And this is probably the best reason why it shouldn't be pronounced Dart Z, because if it's pronounced Dart Z, then it reads Dart Z, Dart Z, Dart, which is hilarious. Um, so yeah, let's look at this. What do we got here? So we got a map structure um, that is keyed by strings and has I list of string values. And in practice, it sort of associates lists of ingredients to names of dishes. So we got our caprese salad, which consists of tomato, mozzarella, basil, salt, and olive oil. And then we got some other dishes. And it's, yeah, this is just an example. This will be a very, very bo boring bolognese. So there should at least be onions in there and probably more spices. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you get it. Uh, and then we got two other values defined here. So we got menu for two, <clears throat> which uh, starts with a caprese salad and then continues with a pasta bolognese. And uh, that's a pretty heavy dish, so we don't need dessert there. And then when we're alone and don't need to impress anyone, we just eat mac and cheese and stuff ourselves full of Oreos after that. So what I was thinking was that we could try to write a function that given a menu and maybe also the number of people that we'll be eating, we could try to produce a shopping list uh, to tell us what we need to buy to prepare that menu for a specific amount of people. So we could then start with saying that the return value should be mapping between name of ingredient to the number of units of that ingredient that we're gonna need to buy. You see here already that like my example is falling apart, but but bear with me. It's just an example. Let's call this math, uh, this function build shopping list. And it needs to base its decision on a menu, which in practice are I, I lists of um, string and let's call that a menu and then we also need to know how many are going to be eating I want to take num type number of eaters but that seems let's just call it number of people um, something like this and just to temporarily make the type system happy so I don't have red all over. I'll just end with an exception. I will remove this later, of course. Um, so let's look at this. So already from this menu for one, we realize that, ah, since we have this kind of silly data modeling where the dishes are represented just by strings, then there's of course no guarantee that we'll be able to actually produce a shopping list for any given menu. For example, not the one containing mac and cheese, because we actually don't know what ingredients go into mac and cheese. Uh, it's probably mac and cheeses or something. Um, but OK, this can clearly fail. So what should we do then? Could return null or an empty map or a partially filled map or, or maybe throw an exception or something? But no, we will not do that. We will wrap the return type in option. Uh, and now it's hopefully visible for anyone trying to use this function that, OK, clearly this function can fail somehow. So we capture that in the type system. So that's a good start. And then the next step would be probably to just grab all the ingredients. At some point, we need to figure out what all the ingredients are so we can reduce it into a shopping list. So let's start with 
the query a variable for that. And we probably need to do something with menu. Menu is a type I list. Let's look at what I list is. Okay, so I list is a traversable model, monon plus. Uh, so that's a good hint. It's something we can traverse over. So if you're familiar with traversable types in Haskell, uh, it's uh, sort of operating functions are usually called something with traverse. And we actually know that these traversals can fail. So, okay, traversing with option as applicative effect sounds good. And once again, since this is the uh, Dart, which doesn't properly support like type classes, like the different variations of traversals are hard coded in here, which is sad, but it makes it slightly easier to choose now. And looking at these, we probably want a monadic traversal as well, because we want all the ingredients at the end uh, in one chunk. So let's choose uh, an, a monadic traversal with option as applicative effect. So here we get to pass in a function and we get served with um, dishes. So we're traversing our menu, which is a list of dishes to prepare. And here we can just look up ingredients by dish. And it just so happens that this bracket operator on IMAP, since this is a Dart Z uh, map, it will not it will do its best not to return null or throw exceptions in your face. So this will actually already return an option for us, which satisfies the contract of traverse option M and is exactly what we want. And we can make this more explicit by uh, using the get method. The, the, the brackets, the square brackets are just syntactic sugar for get and the type of get here returns an option of I list of string. Um, because IMAP can't guarantee that it has a mapping for every given key you give it. And now we actually see that we can replace this with a method reference to make it even, even tidier. So that's great. So now we have our ingredients, which is an option of I list of string containing all the ingredients for all the dishes in the menu. And now we somehow need to transform that into a shopping list. And it's sort of a reduction aggregation kind of thing. Um, so once again, we remember that ILIS was a traversable structure. Traversable structures are always foldable functors. Uh, so we know that this must have fold operations on it. So let's try and declare. All oh, right, sorry, I just need to backtrace. Right, so since this is an option of ILS of string, we might already have failed here. Uh, so maybe I'll just temporarily rename this to maybe ingredients, because this is actually an option of ingredients. And options are functors, so we can map over them. So let's do phase to do final uh, maybe shopping list equals maybe ingredients dot map. And here we get to supply uh, a, a function that does some transformation of the ingredient list if it exists. So here we have the actual ingredients. And now we want to somehow transform this into a map that counts the number of ingredients that we need to buy. And as we mentioned earlier, iList is a foldable structure. So there are plenty of folds on it. And in this case, it might be very, very convenient to use uh, monoidal folds through fold map. So let's try that. So fold map wants us to supply a monoid to reduce some kind of transformation that we do here. So let's, uh, and here we get to uh, transform every ingredient in this list to something. And let's transform it to a single prom map uh, where the key is the actual name of the ingredient itself. And then we need to figure out like, okay, at this stage, how many of this ingredient do we think we need to buy? We actually don't know that yet because that's sort of a global truth. Uh, but for now, all we know at, okay, we encountered an ingredient, we need to buy at least 
enough to feed number of people. So just put number of people in there. Uh, so now we have a neat transformation where we transform every ingredient into singleton map. Now we just need to merge these into one map. So let's do just that. So there is a pre-prepared IMAP monoid uh, that comes with .z. Um, and since maps have unique keys, like there is at most one binding between each key and some value, we can't have duplicate keys. IMAP monoid needs to know how to handle the cases where it's being asked to mer merge multiple maps into a single one. It needs to know, okay, what do I do if I encounter key collisions? And that's why you need to also pass a monoid to IMAP monoid that basically defines a strategy for how to deal with collisions. And in this case, we know that we actually just need to sum them up. And there's, of course, a pre-prepared in summation monoid, which is called in some MI for, for some reason. Um, and this is actually all we need to do, I think. So now we can actually just um, return this and hopefully everything types. Yes, it types. So let's try it out. Uh, build shopping list for menu for two, maybe. And of course, that's going to be two people who are eating that. So let's run it and see what we get. Uh, and this is slightly smaller. OK, we get something reasonable here. So we get a sum, meaning like a filled option. We did not fail. And that carries an immutable map that says, OK, we need to buy two units of basil. But we need to buy four units of olive oil because olive oil is needed for both the caprese salad and for the pasta bolognese. Um, but we only need the two units of tagliatelle because we're only two people eating. But we need a lot of salt and tomato because it's delicious Italian food. Um, and similarly, if we try to build a shopping list for many for one, which it's only one person eating and run that, then we of course, just get none back because we were never able to figure out what ingredients are, ne are necessary for cooking mac and cheese. Um, so that's that's a small intro. In intro, I hope it made some kind of sense. And I'm just going to pop back back to my presentation. So thank you very much for listening. I hope uh, parts of it at least were interesting. And here are some links for you. So here is uh, Dart's Ed on GitHub. If you think Dart sounds interesting, check it out on Dart.dev. If you think Flutter sounds interesting, check it out on Flutter.dev. And if you think Soundtrap sounds interesting, check it out at soundtrap.com. Thank you very much. And over to you, Magnus. Thank you very much, Björn. Thank you. You get an applause here from me in the studio. Uh, <clears throat> I have one question. What's the best way to get started with Dart and Dart said? Um, right. So, so I would really recommend actually starting with Flutter if you're starting with Dart from, from scratch. Yeah. Um, it's got a really, really nice and tight development environment uh, and lots and lots of tutorial projects very nice tutorial projects on Flutter.dev and um, lectures in sort of how to, to stepwise go to more advanced levels. And for Dart said, it's horribly poorly documented, but there are um, uh, an examples directory on GitHub that will show you um, how to solve some problems using Dart said, using pure functional techniques. Um, so, so uh, there is that. That would be one way of starting that. There is also a series of tutorials from Resocoder. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar at resocoder.com, uh, where he uses and explains several Dart Z uh, types and uses them in sort of real Flutter tutorials. So that's also a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And uh, assume you're super interested in starting to work at uh, Soundtrap, 
can you do it without being a Dart or Dart said coder? You can definitely do that. Yeah. Um, we, I don't think we've ever hired someone who was already like a seasoned Dart coder because not that many exist. And we generally find that people are up and running in Dart in, in days, mm -hmm. assuming they, they already know a couple of languages and, and know the web. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's definitely not a prerequisite, but mm -hmm. it's good if you are interested in learning new languages. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, let's see if we get more questions. Um, no, I have one more question. What more? Do you know any more companies in Sweden that work with works with Dart? Um, so yeah, Flutter is actually used by a couple, but no, I failed to actually come up with some Swedish ones right now. I know there are some Flutter companies in. Do Stockholm. you know any other like international companies that works with uh, Dart? Uh, yeah, Mike, work Mike. Kiva, for example, you work with uh, Dart, uh, Google, like Google AdWords, the interface there is written in Dart, and uh, several Google applications. I oh, mean, mm. this is Google, they develop yeah. the language. But for example, I think some of the Google productivity apps, I think maybe Google Home might be written in Dart by now and in Flutter. So, I mean, don't, don't, don't uh, like quote me on that, though. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> So if you want to make a career in Google, Dart could be it. Or if you want to make a yeah. career in Soundtrap, go for Dart. They're investing quite heavily yeah. in it, so definitely. Cool. Again, thank you very much, Bjorn, for your presentation. Thank you for having yeah. me. You're welcome, most welcome. Thank you.